What's up, everybody? It's Sonny Von Cleveland. Welcome to a very special edition of the Choice Effect Podcast. I'm a re-entry coach with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition in Los Angeles, California. We have a project called the Ride Home Program, where we pick inmates up from prison and take them home. Today, we have Oscar, who's done 10 years in prison, and these are gonna be his first moments out. And we're gonna experience this together and watch as we take him for a meal, buy him some clothes, and then take him to his destination and mentor him along the way and find out where he's at in his headspace and see what the experience is like for him. Join us in this very special edition of the Choice Effect Podcast. so much of course i Let's... appreciate that this is a big moment for me man no doubt so welcome to the choice effect uh this is oscar and this is oscar's first day free in 10 years he finally made it out we're gonna go grab some breakfast and uh so excited. experiences man how's it feeling uh there's a lot of emotions you know that are just showering me right now and it's kind of like hard to try to pinpoint how i'm feeling but i know the the biggest one i'm just excited um i'm so grateful and, and it feels good to have men like yourself that are out here uh supporting somebody who's gone through the same situation you know uh, so i feel comfortable you know i feel safe i remember that um something that keeps replaying before you pick me up and i was in that in that facility is the time when i first got incarcerated and i was sitting behind the cop car and i barely, barely caught my case for the first time and i'm sitting behind the car and i'm handcuffed and i knew that that was going to be my last time being out of freedom for a long time so if you can tell us a little bit about what led up to your incarceration and give us some some insights into those pivotal moments during the last 10 years before that you know um i was out in the streets of the city of long beach you know and i was a i was a, i was a criminal 100 yeah. percent. you know i lived by the gang code i i was using drugs heavily um i was a very selfish individual uh, i'm from a central american family honduras my whole family is uh we migrated here well my dad and my mom did and then they gave me birth in 1987 um, the culture that they carry is very heavy uh, with just stick to your own and that's that during that time um, in the city of Long Beach where I grew up at primarily gangs drugs violence is the first thing you're gonna see and sure. it's a very racist city and what I mean by that black and brown are always at war and are always killing each other mm -hmm. it's like you get bred it to want to start thinking like that but I thank God that I, I didn't I didn't get that poison in my head um, so did you have both your mother and your father growing up growing up I sure did um, I both I had my father and my mother I was one of the fortunate ones from all my um, friends I had them and I didn't have them because they would always they would always be gone sure. um, trying to make ends meet and get a roof under all the kids that they've had uh, but during those times, you know, growing up for me, um, you know, I looked out the window and the first thing I saw was dudes wearing Raider shirts, Cortezes, and um, that was fascinating to me, like that camaraderie, that, that love that they sure, were showing each other. enticing, that lifestyle could be very appealing. And and very much, I didn't even know about football teams back yeah. then. I thought that the Raiders jersey was a game. Oh wow! Well, they represent it like that. Yeah, yeah, and I, I was, with I was the, so the naive in, with yeah. the influence of like early '90s hip hop and and that kind of culture. They kind of perpetuated absolutely using the Raiders, especially big time. Uh, and, and I never even knew about football. I only knew soccer because that's what my culture uh, was in, introduced me to. You know, we didn't speak. My family didn't speak English. They didn't have no Americanized ways. So I saw the Raiders, and I, every time I saw a Raider jersey, I said, "Oh, he's he's from this game, right?" 
Um, and I saw that every day, you know, seeing movies that only amplified that lifestyle made me more intrigued. And during that time, you know, uh, my father and my mom were struggling on how to raise us, how to raise me especially. Um, they were fighting with the fact that they knew that they lived in a gang infested neighborhood and they were trying to put instill their beliefs in this. And it wasn't, it wasn't, they were in huge conflict because they weren't able to give me that time. I was getting more time from the streets than getting more times from them. So that the streets were winning. And what was, what was school like in uh, that environment? School was what the neighborhood was. Right. Everybody right. that you saw in the neighborhood, you saw in school. And if somebody got jumped into somewhere, everybody in school knew about it and he was glorified and he was, you know, he was seen as somebody who was wearing a crown for that day. So they glorified the gang atmosphere. Oh, absolutely. It in was, school and in the neighborhood. Definitely. And when you have parents out in the streets still being a part of that, it only made the neighborhood a little bit uh, stronger in that belief system. And when you have adults living that lifestyle, and during that time, crack was heavy. And uh, we saw a lot of homelessness, uh, always going by, trying to sell VCRs. Uh, shampoo, CDs during this time, and just anything, 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 and cards. You know, trying to trying to buy crack, and they'll do the fair exchange. Um, so growing up, you know, seeing drive-bys, uh, stabbings, all of that was familiar. That was like any kid that grew up during that time will share the same story as I have. They saw the same things that my eyes saw. We all just perceived it differently. You know, when I saw that, I was like, damn, I can't wait to pull out a car and start banging somebody out like right. that. That was my mindset. I didn't, I just, because I knew that that guy that got out and started shooting, everybody loved that guy. Like, he was like, he was, he was a man, he was, he was the as guy. A, like, as a guy that ran things. Man, and, like, that dude was call. brave, right? Yeah. Not knowing, now I know, obviously, how well, malicious. Like 20, 20. Yeah, how yeah. malicious and how ugly and how selfish and how empathetic that is, right? Yeah. Um, and how sad because a lot of people got hurt. Let's go get some food. Man. 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 some of the challenges of being incarcerated that you faced going in there and what were some unexpected sources of strength that you found to deal with there? So uh, some of the challenges that uh, I could immediately think about when I first got incarcerated is you no longer have a choice. Right, the authority, the oversight. You no longer have a an opinion on where you want to go, what do you want to do today. Uh, once that's ripped out of you, the freedom to get up and do whatever you want is taken away from you, it automatically decimates you mentally. Um, it cages you, and if you don't accept it, um, depression and stress could pile up heavily immediately. When an officer is walking by and he tells you, get the F up. Yeah. Where to go, when to be there, how to be What there. is taking you so long? And they speak with this volume of voice, which it's attacking this childhood trauma that you don't even know you've been dealing with. Because your parents used to treat you like that as a kid. So they reawake and reawake this hurt that you've been running from and that's the reason why you're in that cell in the beginning but now you're being barked at all over again and it's like you, you experience this trauma all over again and I didn't even know that right so a lot of repressed emotion that you don't even realize that you're harboring that, not at all and this is brought out because you have an uncaring human being that's treating you like you're some, somehow less of a human being yeah, and, and maybe, you know, this officer 
has dealt with so many individuals that are coming in and out of the system that he's a he doesn't care no more. Right. Like, he's jaded by he, the world. He, exactly. He he's in a place where he's he just sees us all as non civilians, no humans. We're just a number now. So what were some of the the sources of, of strength and inspiration that you found to overcome that during the time you were locked up? So in the beginning of my incarceration, when I first got incarcerated in 2014, uh, I went in extremely intoxicated, full of chemicals. Uh, I, it took me about, I slept for like three weeks. I didn't eat much. Um, I was detoxing. Sure. So the first three weeks were my body trying to recover itself and save itself from the damage I had caused. But when I slowly started seeing my hands, my eyes, when I look in the mirror, and I started seeing how ugly I was, and what I had, be I was like a grape that turned into a raisin. Oh, yeah. And and I saw my, and I couldn't recognize myself and. I, it broke me because now I was forced to think I had no more substances. I had nowhere to go. I had nowhere to run to. And it was a a blessing not to have a cellmate. And it was a blessing to be hold hostage for 23 hours in that cell and only come out for one hour because now I was forced to look at myself. Yeah. And I didn't know who to go to. I didn't know who to speak to. I didn't know who to reach. Nobody would answer my calls. So what did you find that, that helped you? I closed my eyes and I prayed. At that moment, I don't know what I was praying to, but I was listening to myself. You were just searching for something. Yes, I was listening to myself cry inside. It's deep. And so how long did it take you to come to terms with the fact that you had to have permission and this authority was hanging over you and for everything that you had to do, we used the bathroom, where to go. How long did that take for that realization to really set in? When the officers raided the car that I was driving and they put those handcuffs on me and they put me behind that car. To that moment, you realized, like, my choices are over. I knew that it was over. And the fact that I was sitting behind the car looking out that window and everybody that saw me behind that car, it's like their eyes yeah. told me like, you're, you're done, dude. Well, how long after you got locked up, how long did it take before you actually sank into the realization like, I don't have a choice anymore? Oh, immediately, as soon as I got those handcuffs in my, as soon as so those right handcuffs away. cracked my arms and I was behind that car, it was over. Ain't nobody could ever do that to me in the streets. Yeah. Right? They, my freedom was taken away right there. I was sitting behind a car without my... I had no choice no more. Um, it was taken... It, it's, it's an immediate thing, right? Where, unfortunately, I've been bred it already from the juvenile system. Yeah. This happened already as... When I was taken away from my parents, uh, and I was in foster care... That's when it began for me. That's when it started planting the seed. So every time I'll get those handcuffs, my mind will reprogram itself. But this time that I got incarcerated this time, it was a whole different feeling because I knew I was going to go out for a long time. And that started the whole decade. And and immediately it was it was difficult. And I remember when those handcuffs went on, my I just dropped my head down. It was over. Before I would keep it raised because I was proud. Cause I was I was riding and everybody who saw me in the neighborhood I'll be like what's up and I was behind that car and I'll be like what's up but this time I knew that I was going for a long time so I dropped my head down because there was nothing to be proud of no more. So now we're gonna head in to Target grab yeah, up man. some hygiene products and some essentials to get you going and off and running as we come out and while we're doing that talk to me about some of the individuals and the connections that you met while you were incarcerated and and how did those impact your mindset going through the time during those connections uh, so uh, a huge impactful moment for me in my life uh, were 
when I when I got to the prison and immediately I got to the prison during the time where they were saying, hey, we have these guys coming from solitary confinement and they're letting them out. These guys have been incarcerated for decades in there. Uh, some of them 10 years, some of them 20, some of them 30. So they were trying to paint this picture that these guys were the most menace and the most uh, dangerous men out in the in the California prison system. When I got into the yard, it was the opposite. These men were not that. When these men that got out of uh, solitary confinement and they were painting this malicious, uh, evil uh, image of them, you know, they got out and Raul Garcia, one that I remember closely, um, we happened to have be in the same self-help group, which was uh, Narcotics Anonymous, and he became like my sponsor. Nice. And this man had got incarcerated in 1979. Wow. Right. Uh, currently still in prison right now. To this day. To this day. Uh, the prison system and they viewed they they painted this malicious person, and I'm like, man, this guy's like so nice. Right. And, and so kind. Society has him painted as a monster. Yeah. But you know him on the inside. Yes. And, really and, and he was literally like a, my best cheerleader to stay strong, keep going, and n nevertheless teaching me the 12 steps. Yeah. Most importantly, and guided me and showed me how to work them yeah. day by day. That's and this is the type of individual that helped me with my recovery, helped me with staying in a straight narrow because before he wasn't always like that. You know, he had sure. his mistakes. They gave me gifts of when they shared their stories, when they shared their pain and their struggles and how they overcame it. I didn't feel alone no more. I said, yeah. man, I thought I was the only one going through this. And you start hearing other individuals that have been going through this in the 70s, and the 80s, and the 90s. And I'm always had that feeling like, oh, nobody understands me. I'm misunderstood. I'm the only one going through this pain. But we you realize know? that we're not. And I, and I wasn't. But see, these, these men didn't have to do that. They didn't have to right. share their story. They didn't have to open up. But I knew that they wanted me to change and do better, to get out here and be successful. And because of these men, I'm able to walk with you right now. Beautiful thing. Right? They gifted me that and I carry them in my heart. That's why I have this saying that I say my heart's always going to be in prison. Not that it's going to be incarcerated, but it's going to be with the men that are there. Because there's a lot of hearts there. there and, I'm, so I'm, and I'm and I'm interconnected with them forever. Alright, so we're at Target. Uh, and one of the essential things of getting out, you got to have your hygiene right. you yeah. got to have some products. It's not free stays open anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they don't provide that. So we're here at Target today and we're going to go through and pick up some essential hygiene stuff for Oscar. To have so here we are going to the self-checkout to show Oscar how self-checkout works. Because nowadays, you just go through self-checkout. This down here. All right, so what we're gonna do, grab an item up, find the barcode, wherever it's at, and then flip it down and scan it across that. Set it over there. Why are you done? Yep, nope. Set it down. That, that has weight on it, so it knows yeah. when you put something. And then run everything through. Yep. Damn, you think you're your own cashier now? Think they're hiring? <laughs> Look at your natural. Come on now. Well, I'm very familiar with the barcodes because uh, back in my past tense lifestyle, mm -hmm. I used to rip the barcodes off. But it's a new person, now we pay. And uh, I'm very excited about this, actually. I need the razors. Gotta keep that face smooth, right? so much. I'm going to take that. Uh -huh. Alright, so you're going to push pay. <laughs> push pay. <laughs> okay. Alright, 
Uh, one bag, so push the plus sign, so you get one bag. Yep. Fly. Fly. Yep. And then skip. skip. We don't need no memberships, it's how to try to pull you in. And then put card. Yep. And then you're going to come over here now, because it's over here, and then you're just going to tap. This is a chip, right? So this right here is a chip. Just right? hold it up to that. Oh, right. that's simple, huh? It's that easy. You don't even see, see it the even, money go. It even thanks you. And then you're going to grab your receipt so they don't think we're snagging stuff. Oh, nice. Then we're going to bag it all up. All right. Now we've got you squared away. Perfect. And uh, now we're going to head to Oscar's home. Uh, where he is ready to start his new life. Very excited about this. Um, we. It's the first time that I, that I know I'm finally ready to be a uh, nice, uh, you know, member of society. You know, like. Ready to be a, a contributing member of your community, man, and, and make a difference. What what kind of activities and organizations do you plan on working with? You know, uh, one of the biggest organizations right now that obviously has been staying in touch with me is anti Civilization Coalition. Yeah. I want to give them a shout out. Uh, Mass Liberation, uh, Amity Foundation has helped me a lot. Uh, it's a community of, of resources that have done everything they can to make my life easier and transition back to society safely. And they want me to experience the less stress possible yeah. with material and with financial needs uh, everything from this you know uh, and prison this is provided right out here you got to get it yourself uh, probably not the best condition probably not the best material but it's it's handed to you everything so there are programs and options available like anti-recidivism coalition and the right? these things are there and I know if you want it you get it so, you know, change is, is going to be really intimidating and, and crazy. How do you plan on accepting and utilizing your new opportunities in your environment for your daily routines uh, to navigate through returning to society? My mind kind of repeats. It gives me like a flashback of who I was then. And... I see now how much I've changed and now that I'm entering society um, it's gonna be a whole different formula that I'm coming out with uh, and I was destroying my community back then and today I want to be a part of it uh, I definitely want to volunteer a lot I want to be of service uh, I've been very fortunate to be connected with anti receptive coalition even men as yourself you know that i've reached out to say hey here i'm here for you i'm your mentor whatever you need you know um and just putting myself out there like i used to put myself out there in the crime world but in this type of world and say hey i'm here for whatever right and uh one of the main ones i feel was to get back to the youth that are struggling right now it's a very important thing to do um and it, they are, it's a different era than the one I was experiencing, but it's the same emotions that they're going through. Sure. And it's the same formula that still has been a repetitive model that the gangs have been using the drugs. Um, I want to definitely practice more uh, healthy choices by doing fitness. I want to run the Long Beach Marathon on October 15th. Nice. Uh, I've been training for it. Um, I also want to continue practicing morning rituals. You know, getting up early in the morning, 3.50 in the morning, 4 in the morning, meditate, pray, regulate any emotions that are not supposed to be there, um, and be kind, be generous, be giving to people, be a good neighbor. Well, right. How important is having those morning routines and morning rituals to you in maintaining your state of mind? When I first got incarcerated, when I got those handcuffs, my choices were kind of like taken away. And I, I find it to be something like that too for these morning rituals for me. Like, if I don't practice those things, my choices will be taken away again. Yeah. It's 
vital for my life. It's not even no, an it's option. A, I have to do it. It's a daily thing. It's a lifestyle. You have to do no. it. It is a lifestyle. You it's a lifestyle. It every day. If if I skip one day, I'm discombobulated throughout the day. I know I'm not myself. I, it's a constant work that I gotta continue to do every single day because I was a criminal and a drug addict for maybe 20 years. I'm 36 now, right? That extensive timeline of that trauma and all that lifestyle that I live on a day by day basis from morning to night is so heavy that I don't have an option to just wake up and say, hey, I'm gonna just chill in my bed all day and I'm gonna play video games. That's not an option for me. My body doesn't work like that in my mind. I've been, unfortunately, I conditioned my mind for so long to think criminal and to think selfishly that those symptoms could ultimately resurface at any given moment if I'm not ready for it. And the, the, the only way that I'm ready to combat that if I, if I do those morning rituals Casa. I've been waiting a long time to say that. Right. They don't open the door, do they? That was it. Alright. So, man. now that you're here. Thank you so much, man. What's your plans? So, um, First of all, I want to say thank you for the adventure. It's been such a uh, a moving experience, uh, way different than going into prison. <laughs> um, Much different. Very different. A lot. I feel loved. I feel uh, welcomed. I feel uh, I feel important right now. I feel great, and I feel a lot of support. And I think that's very important that I feel these things. No uh, because um, you know it sucks not having nobody. It sucks not having somebody waiting for you uh, out those gates, you know. Um, and, you know, we barely know each other, you know, but now I know you forever. Without a family. You know, because this is a big, impactful moment in my life. So I appreciate that. Of course, man. Uh, and, but, and you have resources, you have people, you have a community. That's what we're here for. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve, man. It means so much to me to be able to be in this position. Yeah. I didn't have anybody like this for myself yeah. to be able to provide this. It's just, it's so fulfilling, man. And, um, and failure's not an option, man. You've Thank got, you. got Thank options, you. man. Appreciate it, man. No doubt. Um, and as you see, brown and white, it don't matter. No we stick together. Uh, but one of the plans that right now is going to be one of the most important ones for me to fulfill is reporting my parole officer. And I know he's going to have some conditions for me that I'm very uh, open and obviously obedient to whatever he wants me to do. But uh, I've been offered a position at the California Conservation Corps. It's a starter job. Um, and I'll be with the Business Services Department. Uh, joined the Anti-Recidivism Coalition uh, Credible Messengers team. They go inside juvenile halls where I grew up at. And these men, I would be one of them, become life coaches, start creating curriculums like anger management, creative writing class, empathy classes, emotional intelligence courses, physical training courses to show these young individuals that are from the ages of 15 to 18 that guess what like we got to dig in deep and start fixing these this trauma that we got and start addressing and mitigating all these issues that we got at an early age so when they do get out you know they could get picked up by you or me That's right. and um, be able to live and experience this moment that I'm experiencing um, and I have a creative side of me as well I like to write on the side you know, I like to write street poetry and I like to write movie screens. And um, I hope that one day, you know, we'll both be sitting in that theater looking at a movie that I played or maybe that you wrote. It's mindset. We will be sitting in the theater. One hundred percent. We will. And it's when, right? That's right. Uh, uh, so it's in the works, in the process. And um, 
you know, the plan is to come out here too and just be a productive member of society, get back to the men and women that need the help, uh, go out there in the communities that get neglected and get frowned upon because they're heavy with crime and drugs and just show that, hey, you know, Make change is possible. Well, uh, we're going to keep up with you. Thank I you. I can't wait to check in uh, a few months down the road and see Appreciate where you're at and how it's going and just remember that you, you have people, man. There's Thank resources. you. It's been a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much, brother. Anti-recidivism coalition, ride home program, Oscar, making differences out here and making changes, man. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, it's been an inspirational episode of the Choice Effect uh, special edition. So thank you guys all for supporting and tuning in and watching the show. Uh, please share, please subscribe, and continue to follow for more amazing content. Thank you very much for listening, and change is possible, man. Just give everybody an opportunity. And um, just to close it off, um, there's a lot of men as myself behind the wall right now waiting for their moment, waiting to get picked up, that have no family, that have nobody, because unfortunately, when you're living a life of crime, you burn all your bridges. But at some point in your life, you start making changes. And sometimes family sees these changes as too late. Because we've hurt so many people for so long that they don't care how much we've changed. They don't care how much we're trying. They don't care how much we, we feel that we could get back. And it sucks because when you get neglected like that, you revisit all those loneliness and all these emotions that pretty much took you to that place. So let's give these men that are coming out as myself an opportunity to be productive members of society. And uh, thank you for uh, being courageous and saying, hey, let's give those men an opportunity. God bless you guys.